Hi, good afternoon from Singapore and to all our friends tuning in from all around the world. Thank you and welcome to today's session where we'll be talking about the future of smart and sustainable spaces. My name is Wei Min from SG Innovate. We are a government-owned organization in Singapore who believes in the positive impact of deep tech to benefit humanity. A good part of our work also involves building a global community of scientists, commercializing research, building deep tech talents, as well as working with our ecosystem partners in scaling deep tech for improving the lives of many around the world. As that is why we have formed this community where our work in investing in startups, corporate collaborations and promoting knowledge sharing enable us to scale and build deep tech innovations for the world. Today, we are very happy to partner with the French Chamber of Commerce to present to you this webinar on smart and sustainable spaces. Together with the French Chamber, we have been very active in promoting sustainable practices and also in the innovation space where topics such as AI can possibly bring about improvements and the good to our everyday lives. Which also brings us today, where it is through these events, we bring about opportunities where we connect people in from all areas, such as startups, researchers, and corporates, involving them in an exchange where we explore and rethink the concept of space through organizational planning design and sustainable solutions, especially in times of this new normal where we are affected by the COVID-19 situation. With no further ado, do allow me to pass the time to Lydia Fulton from the French Chamber of Commerce for some opening remarks. Lydia, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wei Min. Uh, good day, everyone. My name is uh, Lydia Fulton and I'm in charge of uh, the business club at the French Chamber of Commerce in Singapore. Uh, I'm very thrilled to co-host and to partner with uh, SG Innovate on uh, this webinar today on the future of smart and sustainable spaces. One of our mission at the French Chamber of Commerce is to accelerate actually the development of French companies into the local market. And through this partnership, we are looking at fostering and at bridging the gap uh, and the collaboration between startup and corporates. Finally, today's topic is clearly part of the French Chamber uh, of Commerce Sustainability Journey and all the initiatives uh, we are launching so far toward more uh, sustainable business. I would like to thank you all for attending this webinar today and also thank our great speakers and moderator to be a part of it. Thank you, enjoy the session. Uh, dear Professor, the mic is yours. Okay, so welcome. Uh, I cannot see who are the participants on screen, but I can see all the uh, speakers and panelists. Uh, of course, uh, they are also participants. Uh, by the way, whoever is operating the slides, uh, can you please uh, share the screen? Okay, uh, so, um, so my name is Arijit Chatterjee. I'm a professor of strategy at ESSEC Business School. Uh, we are a very old business school, uh, more than 100 and, uh, how many? 113 years old, but we are in Singapore for the last uh, 15 years. And uh, I, I do research and I teach uh, strategic decision making, but for the last uh, three years or so, I'm studying sustainability and teaching sustainability. Okay. So uh, we have uh, three very experienced executives with us today. So let me introduce them to you and then uh, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, to, so first we have Esther with us. Esther Ann is the Chief uh, Sustainability Officer at City Developments Limited. Uh, she has been an active advocate of sustainability for the last 20 years and she has spearheaded the first sustainability report using what's called GRI standards in Singapore that was in 2008. Also issued the first green bond by a Singaporean company three years ago and pioneered an SDG uh, innovation loan in Singapore 2019. SDG, if you're not familiar, is the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN. Uh, she was also conferred the 2018 SDG Pioneer for Green Structure and Low Carbon Economy by the UN Global Impact Compact. Uh, she sits on various uh, boards. Uh, uh, there are lots of them you can see on the screen, also see it on the French Chamber's website. I'll not read out from the screen. Esther has also founded uh, the Women for Green Network to engage more women 
uh, to drive uh, sustainable practices at homes, at work and at play. So uh, we have Esther. Thank you, Esther, for joining us. Uh, My pleasure. We also have Zach Wilson with us today. Zach is the managing director of Alpha Tech uh, West Asia in Singapore and of uh, DVUCA. Uh, and he has over 15 years of experience in engineering, construction, and real estate development. Her, his uh, specialization is in clean technology, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and high-tech products, projects for uh, plants, for offices, data centers, medical facilities. Uh, before coming to Singapore, Zach had developed 2 million square feet, that's a lot of square feet of mixed use real estate projects in San Francisco uh, before he set up the Alphatech office here in Singapore in 2010. Zach is also a LEED accredited professional. Uh, he's also a member of the Urban Land Institute and Cornet Global. Zach has a master's degree in civil engineering, civil and environmental engineering from Stanford and a bachelor's degree in construction engineering from Montana State University. Thank you, Zach, for joining us today. Uh, our third uh, panelist is Damia uh, Delham, Delham uh, president of Singapore Malaysian Brunei for Schneider Electric. Uh, Damia is the cluster president uh, of Schneider Electric here in Singapore, and uh, he has been in this company for 25 years. Uh, he led the end-to-end -end supply chain organization for Schneider Electric in East Asia, Japan, and Pacific over 18, across 18 countries. So he has vast experience in this domain. He has lived in Asia for 15 years. He has been in Singapore since 2013. And before that, he spent four years in India and five years in Shanghai, China. And Damio has an MSc in electrical engineering, as well as an MBA from EdTech Business School in France. So we really have a very, very uh, experienced panel here. Uh, thank you all for coming again. So I'll leave the floor to, so the, so the plan is uh, as follows. So each speaker will present a few slides and talk about his or her uh, thoughts on this topic uh, for eight minutes, eight minutes each. After that, I'll ask a few questions to them. After this brief Q&A, I have a few slides uh, to present, and then we'll open the discussion uh, to everyone, okay? So at that time, uh, please feel free to write uh, your questions in the chat pane, and uh, we will see how we can exchange, okay? So over to Esther, please. Hello, hi, good afternoon, and thank you for having me. Uh, well. Uh, we are living in a world that is, is facing a lot, a lot of unprecedented and, and challenges. And I think all of us have learned from, you know, COVID that uh, challenges or, you know, all these uh, threats can just take place over weeks and our life, you know, is totally disrupted. And I think now at the top of the people's mind, whether you're individual or businesses, the word resilience is, is very important. And of course, sustainability uh, is definitely important to be integrated into the business. And, uh, and of course, we also look at uh, not just mitigation of risk, but also look at adaptation in the next slide that I'm um, just, you know, do a little uh, exercise for, you know, that how we could imagine our future home cities, buildings, and the workplace, and, and all that. And uh, some of these technologies, I think, you know, the audience may have heard of it and, and all that. So I would just only highlight a few that, you know, really start the ball rolling about how do we reveal and reset the business model moving forward. And of course, we all know that to, uh, well, uh, uh, more than 70% of, uh, of our planet is covered with ocean. And we are also looking at like the threat of, you know, rising sea levels and all that. So the idea of floating cities have actually, you know, started uh, just a, a couple of years ago. And if I'm really a fan of this, I'm always fascinated by, you know, the vast resources of ocean and how are we going to, you know, we tap, uh, tap into such resources and also not worry about, you know, uh, the flood 
or you know rising sea levels that will kill some of our you know coastal area. Uh, in the world now, 50% of people are staying in the coastal area, and which is subject to the threat of rising sea level. So floating city is one of the solutions that we could hopefully that more people to look into it and invest in it. And of course, uh, in Singapore, we are very small. Land, sc uh, land scarcity is really a big major problem. So when there's a problem, of course, you know, it trickles off, you know, uh, imagination. We have to build, you know, high and also think deeper. How do we make use of the so-called airspace and, uh, you know, underground? And uh, this is one of our latest uh, uh, building uh, uh, along the east coast of Singapore. So we actually created this you know, just an example, uh, a jogging track that connected the roof, you know, of three residential blocks. So also overlooking the ocean. And we have to, you know, when there's a problem, it really helps to, you know, um, stimulate imagination and idea. And of course, with rapid uh, uh, population growth, and urbanization, we are all competing for very, you know, finite resources. You know, energy is one key thing, which I will probably leave it to to uh, uh, Damien to talk more about it. And of course, for businesses like us, we also have to, you know, we have already stepped up on how to reduce our carbon footprint and how to tap onto new technology for game changing, you know, performance, you know, renewable energies and all that. And uh, last but not least, health and well being have become one of the top priority now. Now, uh, as we are still, you know, struggling to get over this, you know, uh, global pandemic. And of course, the whole city planning, how we build, how we, you know, travel, how we really make use of spaces for work and living have already, you know, been changing. And most of us are still working from home now. And uh, without uh, digitalization, without connectivity, you and I will not be, you know, connected. So technology, AI, all these are almost, you know, uh, it's not no longer good to have. It's a must have for business continuation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, for, in fact, in embracing technology and sustainability has proven to be uh, a very good, strong business case. And over the last few uh, months that we all see, hear report and all that to show that uh, climate and sustainable indexes have outperformed the, uh, their counterpart. And uh, companies with strong ESG, the environment, social and governance have also outperformed. So I think sustainable businesses are definitely deemed as resilient and also believed to be better investment and also in a better positions to recover. And the next slide is actually our business model. I will just run through it quite quickly. When we first started the uh, sustainability journey in 1995, uh, at that time, we were really did not have the crystal ball of, about, you know, climate, you know, uh, emergency, global warming. We did it is because uh, we know that our industry has high impact on the environment. Even today, uh, building and construction sector collectively, you know, contribute 39% of greenhouse gas emission. And cities only occupy 2% of landmass, but 70 over percent of greenhouse gas emission. So how we design, how we build and manage our, our property and how users like you and I, you know, how we use building have a strong impact on the environment. And of course, uh, over the years, we have also looked into not just mitigating risk, but also adapting it and how we can embrace ESG and, and to enhance our capitals, whether it is natural capital, you know, a manufacturer, you know, capitals or human capital. And in the end of the day, all these are connected to our financial performance. And of course, the world is changing fast. And then there are a lot of global goals and frameworks that we have to align so that, you know, um, our investors, our stakeholders are convinced that we are aligned with global best practices. So for our ESG uh, strategy, we actually anchor on four pillars. The first one is integration and then the second one is innovation as what I shared earlier and investment is important. Technology and uh, solutions don't come cheap so we really have to you know uh, tap into you know financing, investment and also put money where the mouth is and invest in invest, uh, invest in technology and, and new design and all that. And of course we have to look at impact and how we set target, how we track and are we, uh, you know, achieving the impact that we, you know, desired. I think these are the, you know, the, the part and partial of the good 
practices. And uh, the last and uh, uh, slide is actually talking about the global goals that the, most of the audience, you know, are very familiar with. And of course, Paris Agreement. We are now not looking at two degree. We are looking at actually 1.5 degree. And uh, last year at the uh, uh, Climate Action Week at uh, UN uh, 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 GC in, in New York, uh, CDL is one of the first uh, batch of company, 87 only, they, you know, that pledge the support of business ambition for 1.5 uh, degree. And of course, uh, when you commit something, we have to make sure that we, we deliver it. And uh, if you look at uh, TCFD, which is the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure, we also look at how we could set target and how what are the scenario that if it's the world is two degree warmer or 1.5 degree warmer, what are the cost and uh, likely impact of transition and also physical risk. And all these help us to prepare for the future, to be future fit, not just looking at the past glory or just today, but looking at the future. And advancing that zero is one of the you know, major targets that the whole world should be looking at, not just building sector or you know, any particular sector. And last but not least, of course, we want the world to be uh, uh, equal, to be inclusive and also to be sustainable. So uh, SDG is one of our top priority and uh, I, will, I can explain a little bit more and, uh, during the Q&A. And uh, I think I, my time is up. I have to pass to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Uh, very informative. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Damian Dhelem. So over to you. I think it's uh, Zach here. Uh, These think. are Zach slides. So. Yeah, but, but I can do I, Zach slide if need. I'm sure you could, <laughs> yes. Can we have Damian's uh, slides on the screen? Okay. Okay, good afternoon uh, and good morning, everyone, if some of you are calling from, uh, from Europe. Uh, jumping right into the, uh, the introduction of, a, of a, a few key thoughts from, from our side on uh, smart uh, and sustainable spaces. Uh, if you can move on, uh, I've got just one reminder on, on Schneid Street, but uh, let's not spend time there. Uh, we do two things as a business. We do energy management, and this is how we got into the office space. Huh? Uh, behind energy man runs there's the electrical distribution and of course uh, starting with lighting uh, and, and power supply that's, that's the first need you have in an office uh, and that's how we've been uh, in the past years spending a lot of time in the office space and really working on sustainability and uh, I would say efficiency and comfort in this space and I will focus my presentation on that knowing that the second part of our business is around industrial automation which is more on smart manufacturing industry 4.0 uh, potentially uh, uh, I would say match, uh, material for new discussion in another webinar. Let's move on, please. So uh, interesting statistics because we are, uh, for most of us, uh, still working from home and, and for, for, for also all of us living here in Singapore, this is, this is the way to go. Huh? We have as much as possible to continue for, to work from home, only essential services uh, and also a few people who have no choice should be going back to office, but for the rest of us, we're still working from home. Now the time will come. Uh, where uh, we will be step by step and in a phased manner coming back to offices. And this is a survey that was done uh, out of the US uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago, uh, end of April actually, uh, and the statistics speak by themselves. So if people think that the, the office space are gone, that everyone's going to be able to work from home, that there's no point anymore uh, to get back to office, etc. Well, uh, I think uh, the statistics, and I, and I hope uh, all, of, all of us on the call would agree, at some stage, we're also excited, right, to meet our colleagues. We believe that through uh, uh, working together in the same office, there is a greater appreciation of the company, there's more interaction. Uh, personally, I feel and I've missed uh, during the weeks of the circuit breaker, the, I say, the informal interaction that you have in the office where within a couple of seconds, you can get together three, four, five people and solve a problem for a customer. So we have to get ready uh, to get back to the office. But I would say the, the, the problem statements or the variables to deal with uh, have changed a lot, right, thanks to COVID-19. So if we move to the next page, uh, you see that uh, uh, if you think that uh, office space is a simple environment, well, uh, with the COVID-19, some uh, additional value points or, or I'll say interest or focus have come, uh, have come up if you're on the occupant side of the building, on the tenant side of the building. Of course, uh, living in a safe environment has taken another dimension. 
of course, the notion also of social distancing and safe collaboration is something we were definitely not used to, right? Uh, but we'll have to live with that. Uh, at the same time, on the operation side, definitely there is an impact on the, uh, on the way also you want to monitor and, and manage the health of the people who live in the building. So the, I would say the day-to-day -day task of the facility management companies are definitely got much more complicated. Uh, with the post-COVID-19 situation, while sustainability, and I'm always uh, very excited to speak after Esther, is definitely, uh, because she really said the scene very well, and sustainability, I would say, is more than ever there to stay. And, and to me, uh, post-COVID-19, uh, post probably one of the few uh, very, very little things we remember from COVID-19 was uh, the world was such a green place during COVID-19, right? There were so many uh, uh, pictures, videos of uh, nature taking control back of, uh, of the cities or, or of the lives around us, but definitely sustainability is there to stay and hopefully will be a, a continuous growing interest, including the office space. On the business side, definitely you see all the, uh, the, the problem statement, the notion of agility and flexibility of the workplace are definitely also gonna, gonna really grow in terms of interest or focus. So a lot of uh, new perspective coming up in the, in the office space as, as we move post uh, COVID-19. Let's move, please. Uh, and uh, I would like to stop on, on, on these four uh, 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 points because they really are, are, are really uh, emphasized and, and really moving to another type of dimension post COVID-19. I mentioned already the notion of space management. Uh, we have uh, ourselves and launched uh, uh, two years ago a solution called the World Pace Advisor, but originally, and to be frank, it was very much around space efficiency. How can I make sure I make the most of the space I utilize in the office? Well, today, uh, our customers are saying, well, we're using this technology to ensure the safe distancing because we want to make sure we don't have that many people in so many square meters at any point of time in the day. So really, the space management is really, a, it's not about space utilization, space efficiency, but also definitely uh, the way you occupy the space, the way you make use of the space, uh, well-being of the occupant. Uh, of course, uh, what used to be more uh, taken as a comfort level uh, has definitely also moved to, to another dimension in terms of expectation uh, with the idea of the pollution in the air, the idea, of course, of the air quality, uh, the cleaning of the mind environment, including the air, etc. So uh, really clearly the occupant well-being uh, dimension uh, is going to become more and more critical in the office environment, while at the same time we should not forget the need for operational efficiency uh, because it's very important to continuously uh, improve the efficiency of processes, including the offices in, in which we live in. Can you move on, please? So, um, the future of smart and sustainable spaces, you see, uh, that's not so simple. If you think you, you can transfer and convert an, a, a room in, a, in an office and that's it, well, so many variables, so many points, and so many stakeholders as well uh, to deal with, which have, and so many personas who are different, I would say, angles that are coming from as priorities for them, uh, and a lot of the things we to deal with from the energy efficiency to the OPEX and CAPEX optimization. But again, as I mentioned earlier, the health, knowing that, and that's one of the good news, and probably we'll talk more about that, that later, digitalization really allow all these uh, variables, all these problem statements to potentially be solved, knowing that they will also bring one element, which is very interesting in the office space as well, the notion of cybersecurity, which if you think back 10, 15, uh, 10, 15 years ago, if you had to talk about cybersecurity in the office space, definitely would not have been a concern for anyone. So you see a lot of points to take into account when you talk about smart and sustainable space. Thank you. Thank you, Damia. Again, uh, very interesting, very complex, if I may add. Uh, okay, so um, we have Zach now from Alpha Tech. Hey, um, so next time I get on one of these panels, I need to make sure that uh, Esther and Damian aren't on it because they're very hard acts to follow. But uh, thanks so much. I'm very honored to be on this panel with such esteemed um, moderator as well as other guests. So um, I appreciate that. Uh, I think a lot of the things that I want to talk about or what I'll unpack is it kind of focused a little bit more on the practitioner side of things. Um, it, you know, smart city, smart nation, sustainability has kind of become a nebulous buzzword if you don't really define what it is. And so I think I prefer to talk about things that are more um, detailed and, and unpack that. I'd probably similar to Damien's 
uh, and Esther's like, how do we really, you know, get into the nitty gritty? So for me, I mean, space planning is really one of the most critical things. I think it was a beautiful example that uh, Damien raised where it's like, yeah, we wanted to just cram as many people in efficiently as possible previously. Now, if you'd invested in an IoT technology that tracked your occupancy, uh, you would be able to use it in new and in innovative ways that are you know, profoundly more important than squeezing an extra dollar out of your footprint. Now it's really about protecting human life and the sanctity of uh, you know human experience. So we always say you can't uh, manage what you don't measure. Uh, so it's important to do that as you design your new spaces. And I think what we're really learning now during this COVID time is we don't really fully understand what the next workplace is going to look like. Um, we know that it's never going to be quite like it was before any time in the near future, but we also know uh, that it's not going to be the total work from home thing. And I'm an extremely social person and working from home uh, was very difficult. The isolation is, is, you know, it's very damaging. Uh, my creativity is down, my productivity is down. And I love the, uh, the st statistics that were presented by Damien. It's like, yeah, I'm feeling that. I see that too. And, you know, I look around in the office and we're, you know, we can allow 30, 40% of the people in, but there's certain people that just get turned on by being in the office. So I think we need to respect that that is their power. And that's where they, they get that energy and that wind in their sails to do, you know, what they were created to do uh, in the office environment. Obviously, uh, data collection is extremely important for, for optimization. And in the new context, optimization is a beautiful word because it doesn't necessarily mean, uh, you know, getting as many people just means optimized given the current parameters. So being able to understand, okay, well, let's take advantage of a, of a large conference room to put four people in that can still collaborate, but be six meters apart. So we're not worried about safe distancing and maybe there's operable windows so we can crank those open. But if you don't understand your space, it's hard to, uh, to understand how to, how to leverage it. Um, I think we can go to the next slide. Sorry, did it freeze? Okay, so again, the the previous one, yeah. So, uh oh, uh, that's fine. Yeah, so we can speak to this one. Where a lot of the time I feel the wheels fall off um, with energy efficiency in the office, the you know buildings and and home or industrial is it takes capital investment and. Uh, when you when the entire marketplace is driven by a three year lease structure, uh, it makes it very difficult to make long term decisions. So that's why I have to applaud Schneider Electric for really you know buying and investing in a building for the long term and enables you, Damien, to make the right decisions that aren't three years at a time. It's really you know that's going to be your home for the foreseeable future. Unlocking that time scale enables you to make decisions that are more appropriate with. The time scale of the planet Earth, not just a commercial quarterly reporting or a three-year lease. Uh, what we have seen with this as well is uh, a lot of people say they have sustainability programs and very much to Esther's point, you got to put your money where your mouth is. Many, many people have uh, sustainable goals and all this stuff or they want to, we, we want this to be a green building. But then when you start, talk, start talking about dollars and cents, um, the conversation stops really fast. Um, so I think, you know, sustainability and, and smart behavior, it, it takes some things to succeed that are sort of soft skills, uh, which is defining the goal, um, tapping and defining your strengths. Um, we're doing some consulting with a, a, a leg or dare travel retail um, and, and trying to help them understand how do you how do you look at sustainability in the context of a thousand store footprints in, you know, hundred different airports and train stations around the world and it's you can't just make a global decision from the corner office and force everyone to use the same lights you have to tap that network and use that resource that you have which is all your people you have this massive reservoir of creativity and knowledge and and experience that you can tap on but you're never going to get it if you don't ask so uh, but there are some simple things that you can do uh, that could be paid if you have the choice between a vendor that has a uh, waste stream diversion policy and one that doesn't have a waste stream diversion policy, let's focus more or, you know, weight the, the contract towards the one who's more sustainable. Um, 
you know, other things that are more on the soft side is like, let's define the goal. And if it can be really discreet and simple to do, that's great. We can get a run on the board, or it could be something that's a bit more ambiguous and allows for regional uh, modulation, right? So the same things that work for me in Singapore are not going to work in uh, Amsterdam. So again, I use a term. I use the waste stream diversion as an example because Singapore burns their trash. It's a policy. It's not anything we have control over. So you could come up with the greatest waste diversion strategy in the world and it's not going to apply here because that's not what Singapore does. They don't divert waste. They burn it in an incinerator and it makes 3% of the power that we, you and I use every day of our lives here. So um, obviously lighting and HVAC, I can get into the details and go weedsy on this all day long because this is my, my wheelhouse. But the bottom line is if you don't have a C-suite champion and you don't, if you're not tapping the values of the people within your, in your organization to find out what works in this, um, you know, this instance, then those lighting and HVAC efficiencies are never going to be, um, they're never going to be realized. So I think we can go to the next slide. Uh, so maybe I think this one probably is less important for this discussion, actually. I think we've kind of hit on this. Um, I, I do have this dream that we can work from home and be connected with our, with our people in the office. And I think one of the, it's a bit exploratory right now, but the augmented reality um, and some of the ever-presence uh, kiosks or ever-presence um, rooms are something that could help bridge the gap between work at home and work at office. And so four or five years ago for uh, one of our customers, they had a high degree of collaboration with their um, uh, Barcelona office. And so we came up with a solution that enabled for there to be like a, a couple of cozy chairs that sat around a screen and it was always on. And so Singapore and Barcelona, you, you could see who was walking by on the way to the pantry and you could, you could actually create those spontaneous connections between people in Barcelona and people in Singapore. And it was to create sort of an ad hoc experience. Now it didn't work, it wasn't amazing. You know, it wasn't like uh, uh, Pixar in, in, in California where, you know, there's only one toilet, everybody has to meet each other on the way, but it still enabled that customer to have some ad hoc experiences. So I think we're gonna have to find, and this is more on the smart side of the office, how do we create a, a hybridized situation where the people who are super social uh, but have to work from home, maybe they're on, they just got back from a trip and they need to serve a quarantine or a stay at home notice, or, or you know, for family reasons, they, they want to work at home. How do we create a connection that's, we're, we're getting there, but I don't think we've fully tapped into. So, you know, I have, I have some kind of crazy dreams um, about sort of an infinite workspace where it's, it's when you want to be at work, you sit in your home office and you're connected to the office here. You can hear what's happening. You can see what's going on. You can, you can yell hi to somebody who comes in. Um, so I, I'm trying to kind of flesh out the details of that, but uh, I think we do need to find ways to bridge the gap between the home office and the office office. I still think that the office office will serve an important role in our lives um, because I think it's, it's important to have uh, different places for different things um, for some people, but it's never going to be quite the same um, in, in probably in our generation after this experience. Um, so to me, sustainable design goes back to the data collection. Uh, the most sustainable building is the one that you don't build because you never needed it in the first place. And if you're not tracking the data and you're not collecting a rich data set, uh, you're going to end up making decisions that are either too little or too much, and both are costly. So you know, when people talk about sustainability, you know, there's this big craze in the U.S. to buy a Tesla or to buy a, a Prius when the Prius first came out. I'm like, well, actually, if you look at the embodied energy, it'd be better if you just drove your Toyota for another five years. Um, but people don't think that way. They want the new set shiny object. Um, so I think we need to think about it in a, in a holistic sort of cradle to cradle way. Uh, maybe the next slide. So I think this uh, was also touched on by the, uh, the other panelists, but for us, I think finally we may have delivered the message that fresh outdoor air is important. <laughs> um, you know, Singapore's um, engineering standards, uh, if, if especially the ones that are required to be followed, are so lax when it comes to indoor air quality. 
they have a lot of code of practice or you know nice to haves but they don't really drive this issue the way ashray has done for the last hundred years so i think maybe finally people will be able to wake up um, and see the importance of having um, you know in duct air cleaning uh, you know oxidized uh, plasma uh, dust removal uh, viral um, removals etc and design with people in mind. Uh, it may be a, a, a bit of a, a tangential example, but how do you know what the people have in mind? You know, you have to ask. And again, I, I think that large companies, and we're not a large company, we only have a, you know, a little over 100 people here in Southeast Asia, but there's just a tremendous reservoir of, again, knowledge and experience that can be tapped and understand how do we make it better? Like if we could have one thing in the office, what would it be? If you don't ask, you'll never know. So one of our customers has asked us to to build a dormitory. Um, so we, uh, you know, obviously it's a very touchy issue and it's a very important issue. Uh, but so first thing we did is we talked to a bunch of people who were foreign workers and we said, you know, what is wrong with the dorms now and how can we make it better? And obviously we have to follow BCA guidelines, but there were some very simple things that came out. You know, I, I, I need a, a personal storage space because you know we've been over here for six years. It's not like we're just gonna come in a carry-on bag. So you know we've made a really conscious effort to redesign the entire furniture concept so that it would enable them to have private lockable storage space. And, and again, we think it's important, but there's that's just one example of many things that you could glean when you ask people. And again, I think it's very regional. I, I really don't like corner offices in developed cities driving every decision in a prescriptive way. I think that coming up with policies and allowing each regional office to um, interpret and manifest those policies in the way that's most appropriate for them is, is a really important part of his well-being and comfort. Because what's important to someone in, in Paris is not maybe the same thing that's important to someone in Jakarta. Um, so uh, I think I could probably, again, I'm, I'm kind of a yacker, so I could go on all day, but I think I'll probably stop there so we can keep to time and, uh, and have a fruitful discussion later. Okay, um, thank you, Zach. Um, all right, so we have uh, 23 minutes actually. So what I plan to do is I'll ask a few questions to our panelists. And after that, uh, I have a few slides and then we'll open up the floor for uh, Q&A from the other attendees. So, um, so Esther, uh, you know, I mean, uh, CDL's uh, portfolio, you know, includes a variety of uh, buildings, right? Offices, residences, malls, and so on. Um, so, uh, hotels. So, uh, when I think of malls, you know, I mean, um, I see, and in, in, especially in this COVID-19, there has been a, a distinction made between essential and non-essential products, right? And one might argue, well, when you walk around the malls, many of these things are non-essential. You will not die if you, will not, if you don't buy them. Uh, and uh, so, do you think that um, uh, real estate businesses uh, indirectly sort of contribute to climate change through this kind of unthinking consumerism? And uh, how can this be mitigated? Mm. Well, I think uh, it's not just malls that is affected. Honestly, everybody's daily life, how we learn, how we tra travel and even logistic. And, you know, there are a lot of things that have, have been happening. I never order so much, you know, uh, uh, food delivered to my house in my whole life, you know, as compared to the last few weeks. So there are a lot of changes uh, happening. I mean, there are no two persons things alike, exactly alike. Okay. While I hear some people say that, oh, I really love working from home. It's so productive I don't need to change and make up and travel and I also have heard people say that I'm dying to go out I am a social you know animal I need to see people you know and like Zach say I need to see people even they go toilet it's also good that I see people wave to them you know so I think there are different thoughts and uh, definitely there will be impact on how you know uh, offices you know office space or even uh, home space are designed and built and all that for home definitely people space will be king Okay, if you look at like the shoebox design, all that that's out of the window already because now a lot of people like to what 
from home or, you know, and that will be a trend, you know, definitely. Even when we are safe, we, we feel that after phase two, phase three, we can go back to office. There will still be people that, oh, let's maybe half of the week go, you know, uh, work from home. So your, your space is important. Okay, I'm actually speaking to you in my bedroom. Okay, I have to have half, half of my room you know, near the window as my office for my past four months. So there is a lot of changes that are happening. But uh, there's a, this uh, 21 days rules is like when you uh, get used to it, people will, 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 will be very fast in adapting to the new needs. And of course, when we design home, there's one thing. And then just now with uh, one of the panelists talk about outdoor space, greenery. So of course, uh, by mandatory requirement, 40% of site area have to go to greenery and, and softscape. But in fact, most of our building, our development has already exceeded that. Just now I, I talked about the Ember Park, we devote 65% of the site area for landscape, softscape, and also you know, greenery, even communal, you know, uh, herbal farming and, and all that. Lifestyle has changed. Even for me, I never touch you know, the garden, but this whole three, three few months that we are locked down, we have nothing better to do. Now I'm actually growing, happily seeing that, you know, some of the, the plants are growing, the chili is growing, and, you know, the, the lemongrass is growing. So, so I think the lifestyle has changed. But uh, a lot of people like talk about shopping. What will shopping be like? And even before COVID, e-commerce e has been growing very fast. So I think there will be such change you know, definitely. And you also see a lot of department stores globally have actually reduced their physical presence. So I think definitely it's a very exciting, you know, change of opportunity. But there will still be people who love to say, oh, I love to try on my dress rather than no matter what I look at the, you know, my laptop, it can never see it on myself, you know. So I think there are a lot of changes happening, but can we 100% replace shopping? And don't forget a lot of people like to do shopping as a retail therapy you know so i think yeah and the holiday traveling may be affected but will be more selective but there's still people dying to like oh i need to travel i need to go out you know so i don't think we have a conclusion very clear conclusion yeah. as whether you know space are dying you know office space are dying or, or retail space are, are, are going to be killed I don't have the crystal ball, but definitely uh, we, we are watching very closely and we are anticipating changes and definitely we see how we can creatively, innovatively, you know, uh, remodel the way we design and build and manage. Yeah. Thank you, Esther. So we are running out of time. So I'll ask, uh, ask one question to Damio and uh, is, you know, Snyder Electric uh, is known for its uh, significant investments in R&D. Right. So can you share with us maybe briefly one or two significant uh, outcomes out of your investment in R&D? Yeah, so yeah, thank you for, for the question, Ashid. Uh, what two, two, two points um, to make. One is uh, in, in the past years, we've, we've developed a range called EcoFit. And actually, uh, EcoFit uh, is basically about replacing or upgrading existing products, you know, in the... Uh, in the electrical distribution network, uh, it's quite common to have uh, equipment that are 20 years old, 25 years old, uh, but still in good condition because they've been well maintained, etc. Now, how do you upgrade this equipment? How you 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 make them connectable uh, by adding sensors, etc., so they can have a second life uh, without throwing them away and, uh, and really uh, kind of replacing the whole equipment. So that's a that's an example of a, I would say a, of, of of how we we've been uh, leveraging uh, R&D for really uh, to to expand the life of our products and equipment. The other uh, area is, of course, uh, to use whatever with technology we develop uh, for ourselves, you know, uh, and we make it a point that uh, our factories, and we have uh, almost 200 factories worldwide, uh, uh, but also our offices uh, really integrate uh, our latest uh, technologies uh, so that can, we can walk the talk. Uh, and as such, uh, our office here in Singapore, uh, it's a 25-year-old building. Uh, we've done a complete retrofit uh, uh, with our technologies inside, and, and it will be uh, fully carbon neutral by the end of the year, leveraging, first of all, the, 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 the technology we deploy to the market. So two examples. Thank you, Damia. I mean, you know, R&D is so important, you know, for sustainability. So um, my uh, one more question to the panelists, to Zach. Uh, so uh, I would request you to sort of uh, be, be uh, succinct because we want to keep some time at the end for the other attendees. Uh, so we've been talking about, you know, the, few, the name of this topic is Future of Smart and Sustainable Spaces.
So do you think there's an overlap there? I mean, somebody who's leading a sustainable lifestyle is smart already. And somebody who is smart will not lead an unsustainable lifestyle. I think there is a, I mean, again, uh, I'm not big, I, I, even though I use them, I, I'm not a huge on buzzwords. I'm, I'm always like, well, what do you mean by that? What do you, when people start talking about cloud computing, I was like, well, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Well, pretty soon it comes down to, well, I mean a server that's somewhere else instead of sitting in my office. That's all it is. So I don't want to overcomplicate it. I mean, to me, the smart and sustainable building is one that you take intentional and thoughtful time and set it aside and you take the time to come up with a real solution that is responding to the needs of the people that you're, that building is going to serve. I mean, the built environment is there to, to enhance human dignity and the experiences we have in our everyday life and to help us be more productive uh, and a more important um, you know, player in, in this life that we're given. So I think, you know, smart and sustainable, it's, it, to me, it's the same thing as taking thoughtful time to do it right the first time and to ask the right questions of the right people and to invest and care about, you know, um, what matters to them. So I mean, we're all here to serve yeah, someone, thank right? You. I, I agree with you that we need to ask the right questions. And, you know, I am glad that you mentioned human dignity and so on. So may I request Wayne to share, uh, I have a, f I'll, I promise we'll have 10 minutes at the end to address questions from the audience. So uh, quickly, so, uh, yeah, the next slide, please. Yeah, no, 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 move back. You see, this is the, uh, yes, yeah, so when it's remote control, you have to wait till I say next, okay? So this is a building. Um, this used to be the Gap building, you know, uh, at San Bruno, California. And it, this is supposed to be a green building, but then when it was made, it was 16 miles away. I know Zach has been at Stanford, you, you probably know the area. So 16 miles from headquarters and also employees to drive 16 miles. So if you add the commute, the amount of energy spent to go to that green building, it would actually won't be green anymore. Right? I think now it is a YouTube headquarters. So moving on the next slide, um, you can see the rooftop, the green top and the green roof and so on. Next slide. So when we talk of e-commerce, you know, I mean, digital, so, so much of impulse buying is so easy, right? Any um, 10 year old can now buy stuff online if, uh, if, if it's not locked, the iPhone, is, the phone is not locked, right? And, uh, you know, a tiny little thing uh, arrives at your home with a lot of packaging and just a little small thing, uh, you know? So, so it, it generates tremendous amount of packaging and waste, okay? So I, I remember this funny uh, thing about a National Geographic talking about the problem of plastic uh, and it arrives in a plastic wrapped thing, um, uh, that kind of uh, uh, problem, right? So the next slide, please. So uh, what is to be sustained? So yeah, can you click it again? Yeah, uh, can you just have the whole thing there? Yeah, so sustainability is about, you know, the three things, profit, planet, and people. You have to make money. You, you should not make money by trashing everything else and you should not make money by trashing people. You know, we talk of human resources, but ultimately, you know, Zach, you mentioned human dignity, so human beings, not just a resource that you can extract, you know. So um, these three things is very simple. Now, the problem is that uh, profit often often takes precedent over other two things, you know, and mostly planet, because in a democracy, people can vote, but unfortunately, you know, animals and trees cannot vote. So that's the problem. We have, we have the vote uh, tomorrow, right? So uh, everyone who is voting, uh, you know, uh, best of best wishes. So moving on to so the next slide. So uh, what is inside? So I'll just, I'm, uh, so Wayman, can you just go a bit faster over these? So what is inside? So this is one example from the food industry, you know, the food that we eat, it has all these nutrition fat calories, right? We are now very health conscious, carb, protein, fat, all of that. But then, you know, this is inside, just like a LED certified building, you know? the product but then actually what is outside is terrifying because the food has to travel next slide please the food has to travel and all this is basically nothing but what economists call externalities you know the the food is great uh, <laughs> but whatever is around it, it it is trashing the planet so next slide um, so just like that water you know a very controversial product to be sold uh, next uh, yeah, so the food has to travel and you can see that the problem is that uh, 
when we talk of sustainable, it, it's amazing how much supply chain illiterate we are, you know. We are totally illiterate uh, in terms of supply. We don't know whatever products I'm using. I have absolutely no idea from where they come. I have no idea what is be, what is inside my laptop. I have no idea how much water has been spent in wearing, in preparing the jeans that I'm wearing, things like that. You know? So this is about supply chain literacy, actually. So moving on in the next slide. So again, next slide. So what is outside? You know, the orangutan doesn't have a home. You know, uh, he had a LEED certified home, by the way. You know, <laughs> but and now he doesn't have. Okay, the next one. So uh, the questions, the questions are important I think, than the answers. So here are some questions for you. A LEED certified building is miles away from where employees live. Does the energy usage in the commute count? US, you know, everyone has a front porch and a backyard because US has a lot of, lot of land. So how is an urban sp sprawl has been certified green? Is it green? That is the question. Uh, I guess I'm referring to something about land use planning, you know, the big uh, things. And so this is one example, a soybean trader, we know that it's a soybean trade, which has actually destroyed the rainforest in Brazil for the last uh, decade or more. So soybean trader sources from the Brazilian rainforest, from the Cerrado, he operates from a green building. So is the building green? <laughs> that is the question, you know. Uh, okay, a few more. So. Do smart people use less resources? You know, uh, so when I think of sustainable spaces, what comes to my mind are the dense forests in central India, which now the mining giants are wanting to extract coal and dolomite and bauxite from. It was a sustainable space, the forest, you know, uh, or the river is a sustainable space. Uh, we're talking about biomimicry in buildings and so on, but you know, that's the real thing. The next one, please. Uh, so how to locate these people who are smart and who use less resources? Well, unfortunately, those people have no access to webinars. You know, those people are living in places who are not talking and lecturing. So I would, I'm guilty and I know that my lifestyle is not sustainable. So how to listen and learn. So I think managers need to listen and learn from people who use less resources. And most of, almost always those people are poor people. Okay. So this is the problem, I think. And, and sustainability is, you know, Zach said it's, it's become a buzzword, but I don't think it will remain a buzzword anymore. Uh, I, I don't want to be the pessimist here. I know managers, make things happen. So I, I teach managers, so managers have to be optimistic, you know. Managers must think that every problem has a solution. But I want, I do not want to be the carrier of bad news, but if you have thought that COVID-19 is uh, a crisis, then I will say, you know, cheer up, the worst is yet to come. Okay, so which is climate change, all right. So I'll stop there. We have seven minutes. Maybe we can go over one or two minutes. Um, let, I've been asked by Lydia to look at, uh, when, when you mean to look at this pain and, and look at the questions which have got the highest votes. <laughs> so let me just do that work for our panelists and then any one of you three can answer that question. So Hervé Jari asks, uh, what is the future of hot desking? Mm -hmm. I guess it is taking turns from, from, from one desk, you know, people work from home uh, in a certain week. So on the one hand, desirable to combine optimized workspace and increase work from home. On the other hand, not matching COVID-19 constraint. I think it's a very interesting question. So anyone can answer this. Uh, as a major landlord in Singapore, I mean, definitely we have been looking at, you know, uh, both conventional, you know, lease and also uh, uh, co-office space over the past few years. And the whole world, actually, uh, the co-office space, collaborative uh, workspace design was actually, you know, very, very popular. And until, you know, COVID came in, that everything, everything go, uh, you know, uh, uh, was disrupted. And uh, even Airbnb has, you know, you know, suffered a lot. So, but I think like I... Uh, uh, say earlier, uh, people adapt to situation very fast. Okay, and 
if we are talking about distancing, is it normal that we really keep a distance from everybody, even your loved one? You know, when was the last time you shake people's hand and hug people? Are they, is it going to be sustainable? Are you going to be a whole life? You're not going to shake people's hand and, and hug people. And hot desking is also there are solutions to, you know, to really do sanitize the whole space and, and all that. So I think um, uh, we are still in the early stage of, you know, how to live with, you know, COVID. And uh, even after COVID, there may be other, okay? So now it's like you really find solution to coexist with COVID or even future, you know, pandemic. And life has to go on. And I think there will be solutions. One door closed, the other door will open. Thank you. Thank I, you, Esther. I, I see hot desking as being, continue to be very important, especially as a lot of, uh, you know, we've heard a lot of chatter through the marketplace of people reducing their spatial footprint. And so if you've got team A and team B, you don't need A plus B seats. You need just times one with a little bit of extra. So I think it's going to be important. I think how we treat those hot desks is going to be more formalized and we're going to learn cultural norms that are appropriate and enable those to function for us in a way that maybe when we had so much personal space was not possible. So I'm actually yeah. optimistic about right. Right. being able to reduce footprints. Yeah. And I think hot desking also enables uh, colleagues to sort of know each other, you know, what's going on in their lives. Sort of, you know, I'm, I won't be here on Wednesday because I have something, uh, some other. Okay, so next question from Mimi in Guen, uh, which is HVAC and energy management uh, preference, uh, sorry, uh, are major areas of optimization. And speaking of smart and sustainable spaces, are existing commercial buildings, like malls and offices, compelled to reduce their air con or improve thermal insulation? If not, why? Yeah, yeah if I, uh, I will start here, uh, well, I say they are. Uh, definitely, uh, and they're already doing it. Uh, if you look at the BCA guidelines and evolution of the uh, of the regulation and program in Singapore, it's really been in this direction. Knowing about the air condition, uh, it represents roughly around 60% uh, of the energy consumption in most buildings. So that's definitely a, a strong area of focus if you want to move into a sustainable and efficient building. So uh, now more to be done, of course, uh, and it's, uh, I would say, uh, and this is where I think uh, technologies and, and really making use of the data to really drive a continuous improvement on a very short cycle will really help move to the next level on top, of course, of having the right design in the first place. Okay, okay. Thanks, Damien. Uh, so, uh, Hui Kang asks uh, two questions. Uh, maybe I'll go with uh, the, the, uh, the second one. Uh, she says, I've, I'm sorry to, join, to have joined me at the end of Esther's talk. Um, uh, is the common thread of the panelists' uh, sustainability is an, in an office setting? If you talk about fresh air, one is more likely to have windows. You can open up than at the office these days. How can we redesign offices and community buildings going forward to allow for better use of environmental effects? Yeah, mm -hmm. I know offices which, which have windows which cannot be opened. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, well, definitely for home, uh, we always look at ventilation. In fact, uh, Greenmark, uh, which is the equivalent of like LEED and, and all that, uh, emphasize a lot of ventilation and also put a lot of focus on energy efficiency. If you have a platinum level, you are 30 to 40% more efficient than normal building. So the earlier question about you know office building, uh, I would say that energy efficiency is actually at the top of the priority because in the tropic, every day it is hot. So, you know, the ten we will we'll find it hard not to, you know, have like, you know, a, a comfortable thermal comfort. So, but how do we make sure that we track the efficiency? We actually look at all the energy audit every year and we have to look at technology, how to raise energy efficiency is the most important thing. And of course, windows, they're actually R&D looking at how we can use, you know, uh, look at uh, operable windows. But of course, there will be a lot of issues looking at like safety, you know, how do we balance it? If windows can open, if the high rise building you know if you can open what if you know it, it, it will compromise on the safety of people so there are a lot of things I'm sure the you know government agencies are actually looking into it and the building sectors are always look at you know uh, uh, you know look at ahead of, of problem or you know find solutions I, I'm sure this is something that you know is on the radar Thank you, Esther. So here's one question, Daniel. Daniel has two questions. I think the first one is more fundamental, which I don't think we, we, can, we can sort of solve that in two minutes. Uh, he asks, uh, sustainability is costly and uh, clean, green, etc. Tech are typically relatively expensive. 
you know i think led certification is very costly all these things and uh, corporations exist to return profit it is often put to the government to deal with public goods how do you think we can balance these two conflicting considerations for real sustainability so it's about if i, balancing if I could answer that i just i mean i think some of your arjit i'm sure you're familiar with andres duaney right so our economic models are very poor at pricing the cost of things we're very good at describing a little bit of the cost, but we don't take in terms of the long-term cost. So they, his big thing was the cost to get a gallon of fuel to a US military craft is like $14,000. Because when you take in all that it took and all the exploitation and all the things that had to be in place for that gallon of fuel to get to that aircraft on the middle of the ocean, it's $14,000 a gallon, right? So we're very poor at pricing the full cost. So we might know what something costs, but we don't really know the value of it. So I think it's important that we think, we have an economic model that understands things in this little tiny context, and it's the context that enables us to make profit. But if we look at the long term, you know, 60 years ago, they're burning tires to get rid of them, and we're paying the cost of that. So when we find out how better to understand the actual cost of what we're doing, then I think that sustainability and investing it will become an absolute slam dunk no-brainer. We have to get off quarterly report timeframes. We have to get on global timeframes and our grandchildren's timeframes. And then all this stuff becomes a rounding error on investment. So, sorry, I get a bit excited about that comment. <laughs> okay. Well, um, uh, whether it's good news or bad, we'll see the consequences. But, uh, you know, more than half of uh, publicly listed firms have delisted in the last decade. Okay, so people are going private equity and, and so on and so forth. And many private equities and hedge funds are actually openly uh, advocating for to go green. You know, uh, I don't know how many trillions of dollars BlackRock manages or seven trillion or something. And I think Larry Fink was talking about sustainability a few months ago. Can, can I just get a quick, quick answer that we should not just look at sustainability as cost, but look at it in fact, look at it as a uh, long term investment. And if you want to talk about cost, actually, energy efficiency help us to save costs as well. And uh, over the last uh, uh, six or seven years, we save about $28 million in terms of utility. And of course, branding and, you know, uh, reputation are all priceless. And uh, the, over the last six months, I already shared uh, the data that, in fact, a lot of institutions institutional investors are looking at, you know, uh, the ESG performance of companies before they pack their millions of dollar investment in them. Definitely, mm -hmm. the sustainability business case is getting much stronger now. Thank you. So uh, we've run out of time, two minutes over. So on that optimistic note, uh, maybe I, I'll again thank all the panelists, you know, uh, it's a very interesting, very relevant topic. So I hope it was useful for the attendees. I hope you answered most of the questions. Um, you know, so uh, thank you. Thank you for, for coming online. Over to Amin. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. So, Julius, I would just like to take this opportunity once again to thank uh, Professor Arijit, Esther, Zach, and Damien, as well as Lydia, for joining us in this uh, webinar. I think it has been a very great sharing, very great insights coming from all the speakers, as well as the moderator. Uh, so, with that, uh, I think we will conclude this uh, webinar. So thank you all the attendees. Okay, there's about 100 of you who stayed with us throughout the end. So thank you so much. Uh, we will be sending out a post-event email. Okay, we will be sharing some of the speaker's slides as well as the YouTube link to today's uh, webinar session. Okay, thank you so, so much. So do keep, a, do keep, a, do keep a, a look out for the mail. At the same time, if there's any questions or queries or you'd like to reach out to any of the speakers for any form of uh, collaboration opportunities, do drop us a mail at events at sgnovi.com. Okay, with that, once again, I'd like to thank the speakers. Thank you, everyone, for giving us such a wonderful event today. Thank you. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you all. So thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.